Now we go to some of the key Greek astronomers. We'll probably do Aristotle today, and then from then we'll continue Aristotle. Aristotle was the first person, he was one of the first persons to argue that the Earth is round, okay? That the round spherical Earth. Remember back then, they used to believe in a flat Earth. They used to believe in the Earth like this, flat Earth theory, okay? So he's also known for being a philosopher and also the teacher of Alexander the Great. These are the arguments he used. They're pretty clever arguments to uh, argue that the Earth is round, okay? He said, a ship eventually disappears as it sails in the sea. So as he sailed in ships and he went to different places, you notice that the sky looked different, the positions of stars changed in the sky. It's a pretty clever argument. If you live on a flat Earth, no matter where you go, the sky, the positions won't change, okay, on a flat Earth. So you have to do some traveling in order to be able to make this argument. Second one, the sky looks different from different parts of the Earth. Yes, that also, you know, pretty much similar to that. Um, the shadow of the Earth cast on the moon is always round, never a straight line. So basically, one after another, they are pretty strong arguments. This one is saying, if a ship sails, eventually they're going to fall below your horizon. So the, he notices that the Earth is curved. The sky looks different. This is probably the strongest argument, the shadow of the Earth cast on the moon. What is that event called when the moon goes under our shadow? It starts with L, lunar eclipse. Right? So if the Earth was round and it cast a shadow on the moon, what kind of shadow would it be? Look at the shadow of the folder. Yeah, flat shadow. It would have straight edges, you see here. Or even it might even be exactly straight, like a straight line, you see. So all you have to do is just be observant. That's, that's most, mostly what science is. Observe the sky. Look at it. See what your theory is. Is the sky showing that? So he looks at lunar eclipses and then he sees, this is what he sees. You see here? This is a typical lunar eclipse. Roundish. Roundish. So when you look at the lunar shadow, the, the Earth's shadow on the moon, look at how round it is. That's it. That's, that's simple. Be observant. Look at the sky. It's round. Earth can't be flat, okay? And this is his first argument. Star is invisible from A, always below the horizon. Star is visible from B, you see? So he looks over here. If you're over here, if you're this star, you cannot see it from here. But if you go over here, you can see this star, you see? So that's the part of the argument that I was saying. The sky looks different from different parts of the Earth, you see? I've heard there's still a society that calls themselves the Flat Earth Society. I don't know, does anyone here belong to them? You might want to uh, cancel your membership, okay? I don't know how they can still believe in that theory. I mean, it's been disproven thousands and thousands of years ago, but some people still willing to believe false things. Okay, so uh, that's good enough for today. <coughs> We continue here uh, on lecture three. Remember, we were covering some of the main uh, people involved in the history of astronomy. We got to the Greek astronomers. We talked about Aristotle and his contribution. So now we have uh, another person, Aristarchus. It sounds like Aristotle. Aristarchus is called the Copernicus of antiquity, which means the ancient Copernicus. Uh, why? Well, because he is the first one, to propose that the sun is the center of our solar system, okay? So, and this is called the heliocentric model. Helios means sun. Heliocentric model means sun center. So back then, for many, many, many centuries, the geocentric model was what was ruling the governing theory. So uh, his theory did not last too much because he didn't really have a proof of his theory. And so he wasn't able to back it up, but he was correct, of course, as we're going to see. The correct model is a sun-centered model. One of the things that he proposed is that if truly it's the Earth going around the sun, so I see here's the sun, here's the Earth going around the sun. 
So here, this is the model that he proposed, heliocentric model. Sun is centered in the middle, Earth is going around the sun, and of course other planets going around the sun too. So he was correct. So he was even clever enough to say this. If there is a star at a distance, we should be able to uh, notice a parallax of the star. Okay, remember in the first lecture we learned about parallax. When you're, when you're looking at an object from your two eyes, it appears to um, shift. So he said, if we're looking at the star from uh, the Earth over here, and then we go over here, the star should appear to shift. He was genius, before Christ, imagine. He said, the star should parallax. They should ap appear to shift. But what was the problem? <coughs> Is the shift of the stars noticeable? You remember we learned about the units of the arc minutes and the arc seconds? We said, take a degree, break it up into six equal parts. Take that, break it up into six equal parts, and that's called the arc second. And then we notice that the parallax angle of stars is even less than an arc second, half an arc second, a quarter of an arc second, uh, you know, uh, 0.0003 arc seconds or whatever, you know. So, because the stars are so far away, we he wasn't able to notice the parallax angle of stars. He wasn't able to measure parallax angle of stars. And then other people at this time probably use this as an argument against it. You see, they said, huh, par uh, stars don't seem like they're parallaxing. <coughs> Therefore, you are wrong, Aristarchus. The Earth is actually not going around the sun. Ooh, you see that? So what they did, they changed it. Well, they didn't really change it because the governing theory was the Earth is the center. He was trying to change it to the sun center, you know. Uh, so sun is going around the Earth. This was the governing theory. What kind of a model is this? Geocentric. So the people who are fighting against his theory said, look, the Earth doesn't move. Because the Earth doesn't move, that's why the stars don't parallax. You see that? It's a very subtlety. So this <clears throat> really shows us something very important in science and in the history of uh, knowledge. Just because you don't notice something or you don't see something or you can't measure something, does that mean that thing doesn't exist? No. When was the first time that we able to measure parallax angle of stars very, very accurately? Computer technology. Telescopes that were so finely tuned, computer run, computer generated, that we actually started measuring parallax angle of stars in the 20th century. In other words, it was all there for many, many centuries. We just couldn't notice it. It was too small. Okay? So the people who are saying, oh, the geocentric is correct because stars aren't parallaxing, they're wrong. They actually were parallaxing. We couldn't measure it. Okay? <clears throat> so. Think about all the other things that you think of now, the knowledge. We still haven't discovered them. We haven't seen them. We haven't measured them. But are they out there? Maybe. Such example, what kind of examples can we think of? Dark matter? Have we measured them? Have we found them? Have we discovered them? Have we measured their mass? No. Does that mean they're out there? Maybe. You know, how about String theory, you know, the little strings. Uh, string theory says <laughs> particles are made up of little strings. Have we measured the mass of strings in string theory? Have we discovered them? Have we, do we have firm evidence of them? Not quite yet. But are they there? Maybe, maybe not. You see what I mean? So you got to have your mind open. Just because we haven't measured something, we don't have firm evidence of it, doesn't mean that it's not out there. How about black holes? How, how about wormholes? How about time travel? Bring in everything that you can think of. How about alternate universes, parallel universes, all those things that you want to think about. And not just in the realm of astronomy. You can think of the realm of biology and all the other knowledge that we have. We're still not quite there. We're, all, we're going to be discovering new things as the centuries go on. So to me, it's very, very exciting 
because you see this in the past history of knowledge. People said geocentric is the one that should be right because we don't know this, the, the parallax, they were wrong. Now we do notice it. Now we can measure it, you see? So uh, all that knowledge is forthcoming. We're going to be discovering new, new, new stuff. OK, so now let's go to the next person. <coughs> So to me, Eratosthenes is also pretty interesting. Uh, his discovery, not just dis not so much discovery, but his cleverness. Uh, he he was the first one to accurately give a measurement of the circumference of the Earth by comparing the objects, the shadow of objects in Cyrene and Alexandria, and found that objects in Alexandria cast a seven-degree shadow. So. Uh, he lived in Egypt. Egypt back then was one of the main areas of knowledge in the Hellenistic world. Remember uh, Alexander the Great? He went and conquered uh, you know, the Middle East. He went down to Africa. He wanted to go all the way down to India, which he did. You know, and then on the, on the trip, of course, he died and stuff like that when, while coming back. So it's a lot of interesting history behind that. Anyway, so he went to Egypt and he made that one of the uh, centers of knowledge. And Alexandria back then had a library called the Library of Alexandria. Uh, a lot of good learning happened there. And he lived there. And there was a city called Syene, <coughs> sometimes also called Cyrene. Um, and let's just draw a rough uh, map of Egypt. So let's just say Egypt looks something like this. By the way, they have now rebuilt that Library of Alexandria. They call it the modern Library of Alexandria. Uh, Alexandria right now is what city in modern world? What's the capital of Egypt now? Cairo. Ale no more Alexandria. Why was it called Alexandria? Named after Alexander the Great. Okay. So they changed it to Cairo. So. Uh, so let's say Alexandria was uh, somewhere here. <coughs> and this city signing uh, was somewhere here, let's say. <coughs> so basically, there was a particular day, or at least a couple of days, where when the sun rose, remember the sun rises uh, in the uh, east and then sets in the west. So you know, in the map wise, it's going this way. So the sun would go directly over the city of Sain, directly over. So an object in the city of Sain would cast no shadow. Uh, so if you had a tree, for example, okay? So in, if, it was, if the tree was in Sain, no shadow. Or there was a famous well in Sain. You can think of it that way. And if you look down the uh, well, no shadow. The sun is directly overhead. You see? So the sun is here, directly overhead. There's no shadow of the, the, the edges of the well uh, inside, the, uh, inside the well. And then here, sun is directly overhead. OK, so he went there. On that particular day, he noticed no shadow, nothing is casting a shadow. Then he took a walk. He took a walk, and then he went to Alexandria, roughly about 500 miles away. Back then, they didn't have the units of miles. They had something known as the stadia, S-T-A-D-I-A. And things were measured in terms of stadia. Stadia was kind of roughly about a mile, OK? so. From here to here, let's say roughly about 500 miles. So based on our uh, modern day measurements. <coughs> so then when he went over there, on the same time, let's say noon time, do you think objects in uh, Alexandria are going to now cast a shadow? So the sun is rising, setting, rising, setting. So let's say I am now the city of Sain rises, the sun is directly overhead. 
Okay, then comes down, sets. When it's noon time, I have no shadow. Okay, no shadow. Now I walk over to Alexandria, 500 miles away. The sun is going like that. So the angle is coming at you, you see? The sun is coming at you at an angle. Am I gonna cast a shadow if I'm in Alexandria? Yeah, a tiny bit of a shadow. The more you go away from Sain, the more shadow you will cast, okay? Because now I'm at an angle from the sun and the earth is curved. You see, I'm, I'm, uh, the earth is curved, curved like this. So when he went over to Alexandria, say here's the sun, Let's, let's say, I'm gonna assume the sun is here on, that, on the next day, about the same place, and now I'm in Alexandria. I'm exaggerating it here. Then it's gonna cast a little bit of a shadow. Same thing, if there is a well, Back then, there were, oh, every city had wells and stuff. You know, people would get water from there. So, and then the sun would go, of course, the edge of the, the, the well here would cast a shadow here, a tiny bit of a shadow. So here, imagine there's water here. There's water. Here, no, you, don't, you look in the water, you see no shadow. Over here, you see a tiny bit of a shadow here. You see of the, of the edge here. So he looks, he looks at the tree, he looks at the well, and then he estimates how long the shadow is. He estimates how long the shadow is. He estimates the length of the, uh, the height of the tree. And then he estimates that this angle, this angle is seven degrees. This angle is seven degrees. Of course, he, he probably might have a tool like a protractor, but not exactly something like our modern day protractor, okay? So he probably does a rough measurement. Which means, by the way, in his time, he is before Christ. In his time, they must have already known about the concept of angles and degrees. Of course, if they didn't know, why would he even say seven degrees? So it was invented before him. The Greeks, the Greek mathematicians invented the, the, the circle, the 360 degree concept, and the seven degrees, and so on, you know? So he knew about that. So he estimates that this is seven degrees, this is seven degrees. Okay, then what does he conclude from that? Big deal. So what can we do? Well, then he, uh, he makes a, he, he conceives like a picture like this. Imagine this is the earth. <coughs> so then this angle subtended by In other words, the, if you draw between, between uh, Syene and Alexandria, think of an arc, a small little arc here, okay? And then this is seven degrees, okay? And the distance between the two cities is what? 500 miles, roughly. So he says, the distance between the two cities is 500 miles, and since the sun casts no shadow on one of the cities, but on the other city, it casts a 70 degree shadow. If I think of a, a line from the center of the earth to Syene and another line to Alexandria, the, that line subtends, this uh, distance between Syene and uh, Alexandria subtends an angle of seven degrees. Imagine, he's so advanced at this time, because back then people used to believe in the flat earth. So he's not only saying the earth is not flat, he's going beyond, the, beyond, uh, beyond that and saying, I'm gonna actually try to calculate how big the earth is around the circumference. Okay, then he makes a ratio. <clears throat> he says, if I'm gonna calculate the circumference of the earth, I'm gonna make a ratio. Circumference of the earth divided by What's, how many angles does a whole circle have? So the circumference of the Earth divided by 360 is equal to what? The distance between the two cities divided by seven degrees. Okay? 
So that's basically what this is. You can make a, a, a ratio. He could have also gone to a farther out city. He didn't necessarily have to just go to Alexandria. He could have gone across the Mediterranean, maybe go to Greece, and then another city there, the, the shadow is going to be even longer, right? It's going to be maybe 15 degrees as you go further away. Then you could also make a similar ratio, OK? You could actually perform this experiment now. You could uh, take a stick, take the sun, take a measure the shadow of the stick on, the, on let's say, today at 12, then drive over to San Diego tomorrow, same time, 12 o'clock, measure the length of the shadow of the stick. And then you can, from there, you can calculate the, the circumference of the Earth. So it's an experiment that you could, someone can potentially perform now. See. So therefore, since the distance between the two cities was approximately 500 miles, what would he have gotten for the circumference of the Earth? This is a ratio, right? This one goes over there. So you do 360 degrees divided by 7 degrees. The degree and the degree cancel. So this becomes uh, unitless, no units. No units times 500 miles, we're going to get an answer in miles. So if you perform this uh, calculation, which I have done, <coughs> I got an answer. When you do this calculation on the calculator, you get 25,710 miles, circumference of the Earth. And then I looked up the data tables to see what the uh, actual circumference of the Earth is, and then you get 24,860. Very close. But of course, this is I'm estimating the distance between the two cities. I, I, don't, I haven't even looked that up. It was roughly around 500. So basically speaking, that means the technique done by uh, Eratosthenes actually works. He got an answer very close to something like the present day circumference of the Earth. Amazing. Way, way ahead of his time. This guy way ahead of his time for thinking that uh, there should be parallax, for thinking that the sun is at the center. Aristotle, Eratosthenes. OK, next person. Hipparchus. We're actually going to be studying Hipparchus's scale uh, much later in the semester also. He is the first cataloger of stars. So essentially, he just looked at stars and said, OK, I'm going to catalog them based on how bright they appear, how, they, how bright they appear to me. He gave the brightest stars a number of one. So he said, the brightest looking stars, I'm going to classify them as one. Because it's kind of like in a sports team, in a sports, uh, <coughs> the first place team is the best place team, let's say. Second place team, number two. Third place team, number three, so on. So he said, the brightest looking stars are one. Second brightest looking stars are two, third, fourth, five. And then the six is the ones that bear, he could barely, barely see. And he categorized those as six. Then he made a whole scale like this, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, we still use his scale today, but we have expanded his list. Okay, so we, later on you're gonna learn. We, we use a scale, see he went one, two, three, four, five, six. Now we have expanded his scale, zero, negative one, negative two, negative three. 7, 8, 9, 10. And what we did, just so that we can honor his memory, we didn't change his scale. We just, all we did is kind of expand it. So a uh, zero looking star is a brighter than a one. Negative one is brighter than a zero. So essentially, it kind of works in the same order that he, he, his does. One is brighter than two, two is brighter than three, three is brighter than four, six is brighter than seven. Seven and further, you cannot see with your naked eye. You need a telescope. That's why his list only went up to six. Those were the ones he could barely see. He couldn't see uh, uh, stars that had brightness seven, category seven. But when we developed and built telescopes, we could now see seven, eight, nine, 10, 20, 25, 
The Hubble Space Telescope, which is the one that goes around the Earth, it can actually see objects with bright, brightness category 25, 26, 27. Our naked eye, we have no hope of seeing something that dim, that far into the uh, space. We have no chance of seeing that. Hipparchus couldn't see that. We can see it. When you go on online, Google uh, Hubble Space Telescope, and then you'll see all the pictures that it gives us. Okay. These are really, really, really uh, dim objects. Amazing. He would never have imagined that we could ever see these objects. You know. OK, so we end with that. Now we're going to start an important astronomer by the name of Ptolemy. Unfortunately, his views are wrong, but it's important in the history of astronomy to study what his views were. Okay.